So uh, welcome to the Game Changer EC seminar series. Today we have uh, Raffaella Margutti. She's a professor in astrophysics at the University of California, Berkeley. And then she completed her undergraduate education at the University of Milano in Bicocca. And afterwards, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and the James Arthur Research Association at the New York University. And then before move, moving to her current position at Barclay, she was assistant and afterwards associate professor at the Northwestern University. And um, I'm very happy also to, to, to mention that Rafaela Margutti received numerous awards and among them, the prestigious New Horizons in Physics Prize in 2022. So we are uh, very eager to listen to your talk on discovery frontiers in the new area of observation with gravitational waves and light, which is actually a very hot topic nowadays. So um, again, thank you for accepting our invitation to give these talks. And um, well, the, the screen, it's yours. But before, sorry, at the end of the seminar, uh, there will be, uh, you have the possibility to ask questions and there are two ways to do it. Or you raise your hand and afterwards you have the, the possibility to ask directly the questions or just write your question in the, in the chat and then we will read to Rafaela the, the, your questions. So Rafaela, now it's... Uh, the, the screen, it's yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Maurizio, for inviting me. And I'm really excited to be with you this, for me this morning, this early morning for me, this uh, late in the day for you. So yeah, so let's dive right away into one of the most interesting topics in astrophysics in my personal opinion, which is this new era where we can really do science, uh, putting together gravitational waves and light. So first of all, I would like uh, to give a little bit of a broader uh, uh, introduction in the world of what we call explosive transients. So things that appear one night and then disappear the night afterwards. So the reason why we are so excited about uh, these explosive phenomena is because of their connections to many different branches of uh, physics and astrophysics. So some of these explosions are beautiful um, uh, ladders. Uh, they allow us to measure distances in the, in the universe. Those are our uh, beloved type 1a for cosmology. Stellar explosions also release chemicals into their environment and they participate and sometimes lead to the chemical evolution of the environment as a whole. While doing that, they also release kinetic energy into their galaxies and they drive very powerful outflows like those that uh, are colored in pink uh, from that galaxy. But the thing that is mostly connected to the topic of today is that these stellar explosions are what produce uh, the compact objects, the stellar mass compact objects, neutron stars and black holes that sometimes uh, left there, uh, they left there alone, they merge and produce uh, gravitational waves. So these are all the reasons why we should get excited about uh, our uh, very transient sky. So in this slide, I will try to name uh, the questions that I'm trying to uh, answer to with my team. So in the world of explosive transients and world of supernovae, uh, we do know, um, we do have a very good description of the event as it happens, so of the explosion. But as you can see, we have two big question marks that are right before and right afterwards. So we do not know what explodes in most cases. We do not know when that star explodes. And after the explosion, we can tell what was left behind. We do know that uh, uh, neutron, so neutron stars are born this way, uh, that black holes are very likely born this way, but we, don't, we can't tell uh, what lives behind what. We do know that most of stars though, the massive stars, they hang out in binaries and some tiny fraction of these binaries are able to survive until the end as a tight couple. And when that happens, um, these compact objects lose energy through gravitational waves and we, you wait uh, some, a long time uh, and then they merge and they produce um, uh, the gravitational waves that we can now detect. So if I were to spell out these big questions, here they are. So what are the progenitors of these stellar explosions and how do these massive stars approach uh, their, own, their own dead before explosion? What is the energy that, is, that powers uh, this stellar explosion? 
what are uh, the properties, the physical properties of these black holes and neutron stars? Are they fast rotating? What are their masses? And once they merge, uh, if I uh, want to use photons, how does a merger look uh, in, uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum? So all of these uh, very open questions are uh, the key engines, the key motivators of the investigation of me and my team. So why now uh, is a good time to uh, try to address these questions? Those, these questions are, have been there for a while. They are uh, open, big questions, so why now? And I'm going to give you an answer in two points. The first uh, is a purely technological uh, reason. So we have now, now in human history, uh, the technology to effectively monitor the sky in real time. So we can now take a picture of the sky every night and look for differences. And this revolution uh, is happening in the optical sky, but also outside the optical sky in the radio. I named there some of the uh, key uh, players for uh, the optical surveys. Uh, YSC is a young supernova experiment. Um, I'm one of the co-founders. Uh, we use the Panzer telescopes in Hawaii. And then I wanted to name uh, one of the major players in the area, which is the Zwicky Transam facility. Uh, led by Caltech. In the future, looking at the future, we do know that uh, something very important is coming. This is uh, the uh, LSST uh, survey on the Vera Rubin Observatory. And my connection uh, to this eight meter telescope that will be able really to uh, take pictures of the sky, of the entire sky, down to an unprecedented depth. My connection to LSST is that of leading uh, the gravitational wave uh, follow-up subgroup. So LSSD will probably come online in 2024, uh, maybe second half of 2024, and is going to be one of our uh, major facilities uh, when it comes online. So what have we been doing with these new, um, new tools that we have? So uh, first of all, we were able to explore uh, phases of the parameter space of things that we already knew. So we were used to uh, discover supernovae at peak uh, just like that uh, black line shows. Uh, and that was mostly because we were relying on humans. So we tend to find things when they are bright. And we, we, we were missing out on that red phase, on the pre-supernova uh, phase, that was uh, thought to be a very boring phase. When I was a grad student, uh, I was taught that stars just stay there and wait for their end to come. Nothing happens, but in reality, uh, this is not true. We do know that the stars are actually experiencing, in most cases, very powerful outbursts, and they feel that the end of their a phase of their life is actually approaching. So right now, we have the capabilities to monitor this uh, the stars before uh, before the big firework. As any time uh, we, uh, that we have new capabilities, uh, it's always true that we do find new things that we were not necessarily expecting to find. So we were able to find new types of transients that I want to mention right now. Uh, I will not uh, be able to uh, tell you probably anything else about these transients, but if you are ex uh, excited and interested, just uh, uh, just ask questions or reach out to me. So uh, we went uh, from uh, doing um, things um, uh, like sampling the sky with a cadence that is uh, marked by those uh, dashed, vertical dashed lines. And uh, as you can see, if I repoint only when those dashed lines are there in the plot, I will completely miss out on the very fast transients that happen on a time scale of few days. Also, uh, I would also miss out on other types of transients that are instead very slow, but potentially very luminous. And the reason why I would miss out on those very, very slowly evolving transients is because their bright rebrightening between uh, two of my observations is too small and it can easily fall into noise. So in both cases, what happened is that we went from this type of cadence, so those uh, black dashed lines, into something that looks more like that. So we went uh, uh, to a situation where we have a very fast uh, cadence, and we keep uh, staring at the same patch of the sky for longer time scales. So time scales is what allowed us to find new types of ways that stars die, and uh, those are our, uh, fast transients and superluminal supernovae. The other thing that we can do right now uh, is that uh, we actually give uh, all the galaxies a possibility to, for us to discover a supernova. So what I mean is the following, that until let's say 10 years ago, we were heavily relying on amateur astronomers that uh, like beautiful, uh, beautifully looking galaxies like that spiral that you can see in the corner. But it turn, turns out 
excuse me, that for some transients, uh, that is not a good environment to be born. And some uh, transients, some types of explosions actually like uh, that other type of galaxy, that kind of blur thing that I doesn't even look like a galaxy that I, I, that I put uh, just right next to the beautiful one. So uh, for some transients, uh, that is the location to look. And uh, since we were no not looking there, we were not aware of their existence. So the bottom line is that every time we plan a survey, uh, it's very, always very good to keep in mind that we always find what we are looking for. So we need to be very careful in our planning. So the other point of why uh, this is a good time trying to answer to this question is uh, connected to multi-wavelength astrophysics. Uh, so the possibility to acquire uh, photons effectively across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So from gamma rays all the way to radio. And the way I think about it is just as a first step towards what is now reality, which is this multi-messenger astrophysics, which means we combine photons, but we combine also other carriers of information like uh, neutrinos and uh, more important for this talk, gravitational waves. So the first point, uh, if you want, is going to give us discovery power. That's our discovery engine. And the second point, uh, this monitoring across the spectrum, is what is enabling us to understand, to, to model the physics of this transient. So discovery plus understanding, and that is what is allowing effectively progress in this uh, field of time domain astrophysics right now. So uh, again, uh, these are our, my major questions uh, and um, how do we go about trying to solve them? So the strategy in my team is the following. Uh, we really uh, do not leave any photon behind. So anytime there is a transient of particular interest in the sky, here I use 18 COW, uh, particularly exciting um, explosion. Every time that happens, we do repoint uh, everything we can put our fingers on from spacecraft uh, in space uh, to a whole um, orchestra of telescopes on the ground and radio antenna. And that is absolutely necessary to acquire a panchromatic view of the transient and then model the physics behind. So what I uh, have built uh, with my team at Northwestern and now at Berkeley is a sort of an end-to-end -end experiment. So we have our discovery engine that is, uh, a con that is made of two uh, big components. One is a telescope component. So we need to scan the sky and look at what is there. And the second component, uh, which is as important, maybe, maybe not even more important than the first, is that since there are so many things that happen in the night sky. There are so many little uh, either flares of stars or explosions, the sky is not quiet. We have thousands and thousands of alerts, that's how we call them every night. And the only way to go through it and understand which one among the thousands that we received is an important one. The only way to do it is, is through artificial intelligence. So what I mean is um, uh, we use machine learning uh, to filter out what we are not excited about. Uh, so uh, at any point when uh, transient uh, basically uh, goes through this uh, AI um, software and the AI says, okay, this is, uh, this is a potentially interesting, then a human uh, comes into play and decides if the machine was correct or not. What happens is that at that point, uh, the trigger goes uh, to the follow-up team. So I have um, my team that is on duty and that is the one, they're the ones that will jump on this target and they will start uh, triggering all the facilities that I showed you in the other, uh, in the other slide. So where do these triggers uh, come from? Um, well, uh, optical is the main region, but um, for uh, the purpose of the stock, actually the main feeder is, are the uh, gravitational wave facilities, so LIGO and Virgo and the other um, gravitational wave interferometers. So uh, this is how I like to think about the world of time domain astronomy in the world of explosive transient. So what you have is a phase space of luminosity versus time and zero is when this uh, transient starts. And uh, I wanted to name on this uh, phase space, uh, what are the areas that I think will be the areas of discovery in the next, in the next years. And as you can see, there are many different areas where uh, we can actually um, re-advance our field. And that is because of these new facilities are coming, are coming online. And today with you, I'm going to emphasize one of these boxes, which is the, the world of electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational wave sources. 
so I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, uh, somewhere, sometime, you have to know, uh, you know uh, that um, we, uh, the first time and only time that we have been able to find gravitational waves and light from the same celestial object is for 17817 that happened on August 17 in 2017. And uh, um, we know that uh, thanks to the uh, gravitational waves that most likely what we were witnessing uh, was a merger of two neutron stars. And uh, we can map uh, the pre-merger uh, phase uh, through gravitational waves. But once the merger happens, uh, what um, the signal goes outside our bands uh, of sensitivity in the gravitational waves and that's where light um, starts and that is where uh, we can start uh, being able uh, telling the story through the photons produced by this merger. So this merger, the merger of two neutron stars, if we look at that in the uh, world of photons, produces many different counterparts. And in the cartoon that you have there, you have the main components uh, laid out. So first of all, uh, we do know that uh, these neutron star mergers, and this one in particular, were able to launch a ultra relativistic jet, a highly collimated. So when I say jet, what I mean is like an extremely collimated um, uh, ejection of material with collimation angle of a few degrees, which sounds magic for me in the sky, that is going extremely fast. The Lorentz factor much, much, much larger than one and is carrying also a lot of uh, kinetic energy. Together with that, this merger had a more spherical ejection of material uh, that uh, uh, is made of two uh, key pieces, the red part that you see and the blue part. This uh, other sort of spherical um, ball of light is thermal, is of thermal origin and uh, has two different colors depending on uh, if you're looking at this thing from the uh, polar uh, direction or on the, on the equator. The blue, we will get, we're gonna see what 17 or 17 produced, but the one thing that I want you to bring home is that these two components, the, what we call kilonova, so the spherical one that is uh, thermal and the jet are two uh, separate components. They have different time scales, they have uh, different spectra and um, they, are, they live two separate lives, let's say that. A big question mark that we have for all neutron star mergers and even for this 17 with 17 is, okay, so what is left behind? We merged two neutron stars, what did we form? This is a pretty much an open question. People in the, in the uh, field now have different opinions. Most uh, people will believe, uh, believe that this particular merger produced a black hole. However, uh, there is no direct observational um, uh, proof that that is actually that is actually true. So observationally that is uh, still reasonably open as a question. So let's have a look at these different components and let me start off from uh, the kilonova, so the spherical, uh, the spherical component. So here uh, is light curve uh, in, in different filters. You have luminosity versus time. And the only thing I would like you to bring home from this slide is that first, uh, if you look at the, in the UV, so if we, if we look into the very, very blue bands, UV, G band, you can see that this transient evolves extremely fast and it peaks right away, uh, maybe one day uh, afterwards and in the G band, and then it cascades down very, very, very fast over, over a time scale of a few days. This is what practically speaking makes detection of kilonovae um, without a gravitational wave trigger, particularly uh, challenging on a very technical, um, from a very, very technical aspect. You can also see that the red component, so, and I, I want to remind you that the red component is the one that is uh, dominant on the equator. This red component is instead uh, longer lived and uh, it goes for, let's say, a couple, a couple of weeks. All in all, we are producing something like 10 to the 42 erg per second at peak, and we are cascading down with a rate that t to the minus 1.3, that is very typical um, of what we were expecting if this transient were to be powered by radioactive decay of heavy chemical elements synthesized by this uh, neutron star merger. One of the key reasons of interest for of neutron star mergers is because they are uh, cosmic sites uh, of our process, which is the process that produces the heavy elements uh, in our um, uh, periodic table. 
So uh, the counterpart of 170817 uh, received the name of AT2017 GFO. Sometimes people will refer to that as just the Kilonova of 170817, but the name, uh, the official name is that AT2017 GFO. That's a vertical line with dots. What uh, I would like you to bring home from this slide is that while this is the only counterpart of a neutron star merger that we found that was found through gravitational waves, we did have knowledge uh, of other similar counterparts in what we call short gamma ray bursts. So those bursts of gamma rays that we also think are coming uh, from, from neutron star mergers. And what we believe right now is that 17817 was just like another short gamma ray burst just detected through a completely different channel uh, through gravitational waves. So this plot shows you the ratio between the luminosity of counterparts of short gamma ray bursts in the optical compared to an infrared, compared to what we saw for 17817. And the only thing I want you to remember is that there is a diversity. Even if we just know a few events, you can see the number of the x-axis, it's literally a few. Even if we know a few events, we do already know that there is a variety. It's a variety of uh, optical counterparts that can be powered by neutron star mergers. So 170817 uh, was extreme, an extremely lucky case because of the distance. So uh, that's his host, this is his host galaxy. You can see that it's a, only 40 megaparsecs. So in astronomical, in, in the world of astronomical transit, this means you're literally uh, behind the corner, especially in the world of neutron star mergers. This is effectively what enabled the very, very detailed view of this event that I'm going to share with you uh, today. This is not going to be true for the average neutron star, neutron star merger that we will find. So the only way uh, to sample the diversity of these counterparts is to put together some dedicated surveys uh, that will look uh, for EM counterparts uh, every time we have a gravitational wave detection. Here, I want to emphasize um, a survey that is coming online uh, if everything goes well, COVID related in 2022 is LS4, the Lassie Yashmit Southern Survey, the PI Peter Nugent here uh, at UC LBNL. And uh, this is a survey that will be in the Southern skies, uh, which is important for all of you that are excited about LSST. And uh, the other thing that I want to emphasize is that the data from this survey, 90, more than 90% of the data for this survey will be public in real time. So we will be publicly available to the entire community. So if you are excited about LSST, uh, you should also get excited about LS4. We're going to complement LSST both in cadence and in depth. And um, so we're gonna enrich uh, or enhance the data of LSST. 10% of our time is that it will be dedicated to um, uh, projects of interest, uh, among which, as you might guess, there, there is the follow-up of gravitational wave sources. So uh, one might wonder why if we have an eight meter class uh, uh, survey with, uh, um, with the Vera Rubin Observatory, so the LSST and Vera Rubin Observatory, why we are going through the trouble of putting together yet another survey. And the reason is the following, that um, LSST uh, has, uh, has to serve many different scientific objectives and the cadence of the observations are of the uh, bigger uh, survey on the, uh, on the Vera Rubin Observatory is not well matched to um, transients. And here I'm using a type 1a supernova. For you, it just means uh, something that varies on a uh, time scale of two weeks. So uh, way, way slower than the gravitational wave one. And as you can see, the sampling of this light curve is actually pretty poor. So if you want to play this game, you'd better add some more data points uh, to, that, to that light curve, which is one of the motivator, motivations to put together LS4 in addition to LSST. It's very true though, and that uh, the frontier after having detected the first counterpart, the first optical counterpart of 17 or 17, 17, is to sample that diversity that I was telling you about. So we have N equal one event. Now progress relies on our capabilities to go from that one uh, event to a population. The goal uh, being to be able to match the properties of the two neutron stars that are merging which, are, uh, which will be given away by the uh, gravitational wave sources to match those properties of the pre-merger phase to the properties of the post-merger phase that is mapped out by light that we can, that we can collect. 
another frontier in the world of gravitational wave um, uh, counterparts is to try and find a counterpart of a black hole neutron star merger that um, we know they exist, LIGO has detected uh, some, but we have failed to find um, counterparts in the, in the optical. So if we want to play this game in the future, there are two requirements, two main requirements. It comes down to being able to, be, to go deep so uh, why? Because these events on average are far away in the universe. This is a consequence uh, of the fact that for the gravitational wave detectors, the horizon goes like one over D uh, distance, while for the world of photons, uh, our sensitivity goes like one over D squared. So the world of photons is, uh, it starts off a little bit on a more difficult path. So we need to go deep because they are uh, on average far away and we need to be fast because they evolve on very fast time scale. So deep uh, and promptly, we need to get on target. And the only way uh, to do that is uh, by matching LSST with other surveys, but also to require that uh, Rubin Observatory will have a, a capability that we call, that we call uh, TOs, uh, target of opportunity. What that means is that we need to be able to interrupt whatever LSST is doing and say, hey, now you stop and you go in that part of the sky and please try to tile that region of the sky and tell me if something that looks like a kilonova is happening there. What you're looking at is a very complex plot. All I want you to bring home is that the LSST depth, so the eight meter, um, the eight meter area is actually really required uh, in the era, in the next, uh, the era of the uh, gravitational wave detectors of the uh, in the next couple of years because uh, our targets will be faint and far. And uh, if you think, well, uh, maybe I can just rely on luck. Uh, so I can just uh, be lucky and uh, maybe the counterpart will just fall into my field of view just by chance. Well, this is something uh, that was very popular until a few years ago. And but in early in the summer 2016, we pointed out that this is actually luck is not a good idea. Uh, luck uh, would give you maybe 10% chance probability to get something. And even in that case, it would not have information outside one filter, which means that we would not know the temperature of that phenomenon. So we would not be able to do science. So the bottom line, the message is that if we want to play the, uh, the game of EM counterparts of gravitational wave sources in the next years, we need to have uh, target of opportunity capabilities on LSST, and we need to have uh, other surveys that will fill, fill uh, the uh, holes in the, in the cadence of LSST. But uh, right now we are um, doing good pro progress on both, on both um, ends. So now let's go back on 170817. I told you about uh, what happened in the optical. So what happened in that uh, uh, spherical uh, component of emission. And I also told you that 170817, uh, in addition to that, also launched a neutral relativistic jet. And how do I know that that is true? Well, uh, the, uh, the presence of this jet was given away by uh, the a component of emission that you're seeing right now plotted right there that we were able to, de to detect from the radio, which is the, uh, the uh, orange and uh, three gigahertz and the, the reddish uh, lines, all the way to the x-rays, which is blue. So we were able to map this component across, uh, across uh, the entire spectrum. And as you can see, uh, while the, our kilonova, after let's say a couple of weeks, the show was over. It was, the transient was peaked and then was gone. What you can see is, is that, that here at all wavelengths, uh, the transient became brighter and brighter and peaked around 160 days after the merger. And then uh, the, uh, started uh, to, uh, to fade away. So the, this behavior, uh, this later time peak is the consequence of the fact that uh, this jet was not aligned uh, to our line of sight. So at early times, we did not see much radiation coming from it. But as the jet slowed down and as the collimation due to relativistic beaming became less and less severe, the cone of emission opened up. Uh, and at some point, uh, and in this case it's 160 days, this cone of emission intersected our line of sight and that's where we could see the entire jet for the first time. 
once we saw this entire piece of emission from the jet at 160 days, after that point, we were able uh, to map the intrinsic evolution of the luminosity of this, of this jet. So the decay after the peak is something that is happening intrinsically to the, to the source. What is instead happening before the peak is a consequence of our position as observers just outside the angle of this, uh, of this relativistic jet. So uh, if we look at the same, uh, the same transient in the spectrum, so I'm moving from light curve into a spectrum and I'm plotting here all the data I gained from radio, 10 to the uh, 10 Hertz, all the way to X-rays, which is this, uh, 10 to the 18. What you can see is that from a spectral perspective, once the kilonova is over, so after the first uh, two weeks, this spectrum becomes one of the most boring spectra probably you have ever seen. It's a single power law. It's one of the best behaved simple power laws I've ever seen. So we can measure that slope down to the third digit and it's always the same, always the same with time. So the, this, uh, if you want boring spectrum uh, is actually something extremely interesting uh, if uh, we are interested in the uh, particle acceleration. And specifically, this is the first time that we can measure that slope so well. And that slope it is matched to uh, the uh, capabilities of the shock to accelerate uh, the electrons that are responsible for that synchrotron emission. And if you do numbers, uh, that slope implies uh, that uh, the shock velocity is something uh, which is around a Lorentz factor between three and 10-ish, independent from any model. This is just uh, because of the slope that, that we are seeing. However, uh, this uh, super well-behaved uh, uh, spectrum has some uh, drawbacks. And the drawbacks is that it's, uh, it's a spectrum that gives you two pieces of information effectively, a normalization and a slope. We did not see any spectral break. We do know synchrotron, um, a synchrotron emission. We were expecting, we do expect to see some cooling break. To the, that is that new C that you have on your, on your right and new M, the, uh, the synchrotron frequency uh, as well. But in our case for 17817, uh, we got unlucky in the sense that those two frequencies were outside our uh, bands of monitoring, which means that we do not have many uh, constraints on the parameters of this jet. This is the key reason why uh, if when I showed you this plot of the light curves, uh, you could notice that there were many models uh, that could do a very reasonable job and explain uh, the light curves. So you can see uh, the uh, thick line, dashed line, dotted lines, and the gray lines. They all go through roughly uh, the, the data points and it's not easy uh, and probably statistically not possible to distinguish between all of these models, even if the amount of energy per unit solid angle and the Lorentz factor as a function of angle of this jet, as you can see in the, in the green box, those are different from one model to the other. So the fact that we can't act, actually distinguish between these jet models is a consequence, is at least partially a consequence of the very, very, very simple spectrum that we that a 17 or 17 had in our bands of observation. However, uh, the fact that uh, we can say that energy was distributed in some way over some angle, this is already a very powerful sp statement in the sense that until now in the world of short gamma bursts, we didn't have uh, to uh, start thinking about uh, structures in the jet, mostly because short gamma bursts are seen on axis and at any point we are dominated by the core. While here for the first uh, time we were looking at the jet from the side so we could appreciate some energy that was distributed in some wings so the structure of the jet so while we don't know so the bottom line is that the, the message is that while we do not know what specific uh, structure is correct we do know that there is structure that uh, the models have to uh, produce so just to go a little bit more into the details, and uh, I laid down there, I named there all the unknowns parameters of the jet core. Um, I, it's not important to know what 
everything is, but just to say that there are many unknown parameters. And what I want to do with you is an exercise of counting how many um, constraints do we have observationally for this uh, event? And keep thinking that this is, that this is likely the most, uh, the closest uh, neutron star into star merger for a long while uh, that, we, that we will detect in gravitational waves and light. So we have a light curve. Um, we, were, we did not see uh, anything for 10 days. So that first phase dashed uh, uh, yellow is gone, uh, lost forever. Uh, the rise, uh, we could monitor the rise, we could uh, monitor the peak, and then we could uh, measure how fast uh, the light curve uh, decayed after we could see the jet core. And um, first of all, um, there is for one of those parameters, uh, there is no way for us to measure it. Uh, this is the fraction of electrons that participate into the non-thermal tail of the synchrotron emission. And we just put it to one. That's standard practice in the world of gamma ray bursts. We do have one measure uh, measurable, which is how steep is the spectrum. You can see we, we can measure it very nicely. We can measure how fast uh, the light curve uh, got to the peak. We can measure when the light curve peaked and the flux at peak. And one would hope that by measuring the decay, that would also give us something. But unfortunately, that decay is uh, completely uh, determined by other parameters in the game. So we have four effectively four measurables uh, from this, uh, from all of those data points that I showed you, plus uh, another measurable uh, that comes from being able to actually resolve in the radio uh, the motion of this, um, uh, the apparent motion uh, of this, um, of the centroid of emission of the radio. So if you want five, so we have five constraints, we have way more than five parameters. This is the reason why uh, for a lot of the, uh, for some of the physical parameters of 17 weight 17, we can't actually uh, resolve their degeneracy. And among them, I want to emphasize too, the kinetic energy of the jet, so how much energy was coupled to that uh, tiny amount of injecta, and the density of the environment. We can measure very well, very, very well, the ratio of these two quantities, but we, are, we can measure as well the two quantities separately. And that's why we end up with that band, uh, yellow band uh, uh, colored for 17 weight 17 and there is nothing we can do about it. That's just um, the limit of the uh, properties of the event and our monitoring. So in spite of all of these limitations, there are things that we could measure uh, nicely. And uh, among those, uh, we could get an idea of how collimated uh, this jet was. And that's why I could tell you this is just a few degrees. And that has deep implications uh, that are about how many um, transients like this do we expect to be able to see in the future? Just because our capabilities of seeing it is very much related to how close we are to the axis of this jet. So um, this we are now, let's see, almost three years, uh, well, four, four years uh, after 170817, four years and, and uh, a few months. And why, one might guess, might, might think that the show is over, that this neutron star merger uh, produced the light it was supposed to and then everything is over. And in reality, uh, this is not, uh, not true. And uh, to our own surprise, uh, the 170817, it is still detectable in the x-rays. What you have there is an image uh, in the lower left, uh, lower left part of the, um, of the screen. You can see uh, 170817 and the location in orange. You can clearly see photons there. The beauty of X-rays is that we can count the photons. And uh, this is particular to at these very late times, uh, thanks to the beautiful Chandra sharp vision. And you can see that we can still detect uh, photons from 170817 years uh, after the merger. So uh, let's have a look at what, what is going on right now it is one of the most interesting um, things that, uh, that has happened for this event, in my opinion. So the blue is what the jet has been doing. And um, I'm just focusing here on the later time part. So uh, the jet uh, evolution would have predicted the X-rays to keep going down roughly as a T to the minus two-ish uh, curve, which is that blue thick line. And as you can see, the two, the, the two most recent measurements start to deviate. They start to deviate from this, uh, from this expectation. And um, the, um, 
there is confusion right now in the literature about how significant is the deviation. And I just want to take one minute uh, to just emphasize that we are here in a regime that is highly Poissonian. So I can count my photons. I can tell you how many photons uh, I, I can tell you how many photons are there in each of these data points. There are eight photons in one and 16 photons in the other one that are associated to the source. In this regime, the statistics that we have to use is Poissonian. And if you do, if doing uh, um, significances with anything that is related to chi-square statistics, it's just simply not correct. Uh, so uh, the statement that I want to make is that if we do account properly for uh, the statistics of the signal, then you would end up with uh, uh, significance of that excess that depending on your favorite uh, jet model varies between 3.5 and four sigma. So it is still not a 10 sigma detection. It's something that is a deviation uh, that is significant at that level of 3.5 to four, but it's still uh, something of interest. So um, and yeah, this is what I've just said. So if you do numbers uh, accounting for uh, the Poissonian nature uh, of the signal that uh, it will give you this number. In any case, I would say that the final word, even if uh, for those that are skeptical about is it there now or not, well, let's just wait. Uh, let's just wait, a time will tell. We have another epoch of observation that is actually coming up in the next uh, couple, of, uh, couple of months. And we will be able to see if uh, the signal is really going up or not. So let me just tell you why uh, people got so excited about that little deviation from a model. There are two reasons why uh, people got excited. So first of all, uh, just like uh, the synchrotron, the main uh, synchrotron component was produced by the deceleration of the jet into the environment. Just like that, we do also expect uh, that part of ejecta that was producing the kilonova at early times, that was producing the optical at early times, to also start to decelerate at some point into the environment and, and to start producing some synchrotron emission as well. Why it would take so much time for the kilonova to decelerate? Because it's heavier while the jet is significantly lighter. The other possibility, which is probably as exciting, if not even more exciting, would be that those X-rays are not coming from synchrotron from a decelerating blast wave, but they are instead uh, mapping what is happening deep down in the, in the newly formed object. So maybe it is accretion on, on a newly formed uh, black hole. Here, I just have a few minutes uh, before wrapping up, but. Uh, I want you to appreciate why either of these two scenarios is actually extremely exciting. So as I told you, as I told you right at the beginning, there is no way for us at early times to see, to know anything about what was, what is going on deep down in the, um, in the, the location of the central object, because at early times, everything is optically thick. But with time, uh, the ejecta is expanding. So we have, uh, and diluting, so we have a possibility uh, to start seeing potentially some X-rays that are able to go through uh, this ejecta. So why uh, we would be so excited if uh, this would be instead the deceleration of this kilonova ejecta in the environment? The reason is the connection to the nature of what we formed. And um, we can understand it using this diagram of kinetic energy versus uh, specific momentum. So think about that as a velocity. So the early time blob of light uh, in optical light, uh, uh, that kilonova was produced by a component of ejecta that was, let's say slowly moving. It's still 0.1 C, but in this, in, for this event it is low. And that was carrying most of the kinetic energy, but was giving us no information about how that energy in the kilonova was distributed. So in, in practice, what we would like to know is which of these thick black lines is correct. So how was the energy distributed in our kilonova? And we want to know that because that correlates um, with the property of our um, merger remnant. The detection of a kilonova of kilonova synchrotron emission would allow us basically to pick which of these which of these uh, which of these black uh, thick lines that I are the ones that are appearing right now on your screen, which of these are actually correct. 
And uh, what you have uh, now on this other plot, the dashed lines are um, trying uh, are putting on the on the phase space of X-ray luminosity versus time. This counterpart uh, in the X-rays that will arise from different distributions of energy of the ejecta of this of this event. So uh, the key message here is that if this is truly coming from a kilonova that is decelerating now in the environment. We do expect this new uh, component of emission first not to evolve very fast and to be persistent for a very, very long time. So all of this will be there for thousands of days. So again, it's a, this is in a regime that we can still detect with current X-ray facilities. So we just need to stay there and keep repointing 17 with 17 every year and see what, what's there to understand if this is the right, uh, uh, right um, uh, conclusion or not. Let me just touch uh, very quickly on the, the other possibility, which is uh, the black hole accretion part. As I said, at early times, we could not see anything from uh, deep down uh, the merger remnant, but now uh, the ejecta is uh, less thick, so we can see maybe uh, we can see through it. And uh, one uh, possibility is that these x-rays, this extra x-ray component, it might coming from accretion on the black hole. And here, uh, here is how we started playing around uh, with some uh, models. Uh, the idea of this black hole, uh, this accretion of black hole, is uh, credited to has to be credited to Brian, Brian Metzger. And um, the idea here is that uh, the jet emission is going down, but uh, and that is a synchrotron emission from the jet. But uh, there is something else that is contributing now. Uh, to our X-rays, which is uh, this accretion component on the black hole. The difference between these two models of uh, synchrotron from the kilonova and accretion on the black hole is that they do predict different radio counterparts, which is why we are really um, excited uh, to get on target and acquire very deep radio observations uh, in, this, in uh, December. So I'm going to wrap up here. I just want to emphasize that let's just wait and see what how the component this component will develop. We will get the answer about what we what we are looking at right now. And uh, I promise I will stick to 45 minutes, 47 minutes. So this is the end of this tour into the world of transients and into what is happening uh, in the only uh, celestial objects for object for which we were able to capture gravitational waves and light. And this is my way to thank all of my sponsors. And uh, as I, I like to say, I start from the end. So I start from where uh, the, the stellar life ends, uh, but is actually the beginning of the life of black holes and neutron stars. So the end is where I start from. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take your uh, questions. So thank you, dear Rafaela. We have indeed already one question from Jeff Scargill. And uh, while he's writing, uh, thank you for a beautiful summary of, of observations and theory. Now comes the question, what new data analysis methods are needed to keep up with these rapid advances in time domain astronomy? So what are the, the, the new analysis methods needed? Data yeah, analysis. Yeah, so, uh, so time domain in general, I would say that the, what we're facing is a big data challenge. So I think that the entire field, we will see the entire field uh, moving uh, from the analysis of one single object into uh, doing uh, analysis of uh, uh, big populations. But to do that, uh, we need to be able to parse through all of these thousands of uh, uh, alerts that come in every day and decide what is interesting, what is not. So machine learning, uh, AI are going to become, in my personal opinion, more and more important in our day-to-day -day, uh, life. Yeah. And in the world of gravitational waves, instead, uh, the, the challenge is that uh, those events will be far away on average. And while the GW detectors, uh, they will increase their horizon, their, their threshold, their distance uh, very quickly, the EM world uh, right now is not matched uh, to be able to capture counterparts at those distances. So there is one more question from uh, Henny Lammers, and he's writing that the possibility of accretion onto the black holes is interesting, but did the explosion not cl uh, clear out the environment very efficiently? 
yeah yeah uh, definitely uh so yeah that's what what we believe uh the and the uh at first we thought that well it's too late there is no way uh and we could still have some matter to accrete but um, um brian metzger was able to find a way to uh, actually have uh some matter to fall back at this very late time scale so he has a paper that i invite you to read uh if you didn't do it already uh where he goes into the details of how we could keep some stuff uh, away uh, uh, and then I created the later times without overproducing the luminosity at early times. So it's, it's not, I would say it's a beautiful um, scenario. Uh, it would be great if this is true and, uh, but it's uh, one of the possibilities right now. So we have one raised hand from uh, our friend, John Zarnecki. John, can you? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you very much for a very engaging talk. I much enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to ask you a left field question. Um, I'm, I'm sure if you give uh, public talks that you are sometimes asked by members of the public um, to justify the cost of, of some of these facilities, which are very expensive, of course. Um, I just wonder how you handle uh, that <laughs> uh, challenging question. It's an extremely challenging question. So I would say knowledge has no price, but anyhow, uh, the uh, the usually with the public, what I say is that uh, the uh, the reason why we can take pictures uh, on our cell phones is also because astronomy and astrophysics developed uh, the CCDs uh, to do that, and so uh, you know there are some beautiful byproducts uh, of our investigation that might have an impact on the day-to-day -day, uh, life. However, if, uh, if the, cha the challenge is when uh, we, we think about uh, what uh, resources we put in this um, uh, research, pure research versus you know, problems of real life, and then I think that the it's very challenging to answer to that question. But for me, knowledge is, has no price. Thanks, yes, I like that. Thank you for that. So there are new missions uh, in the time domain. Uh, so like the Einstein probe, how can this kind of missions help or do, our, do we miss more missions in X-ray or? Yeah, so I, okay, here I am highly biased. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, heavily involved with uh, two NASA mission concepts uh, that there is a part of the time domain uh, sky that we're not doing particularly well yet, which is UV. Uh, and uh, Ultrasat uh, and uh, Dorado, if, if Dorado will fly, will fill up some of that uh, base space. Uh, but I would say that what we're missing is a white field um, uh, instrument that is in the high energies, so UV, and uh, even better would be uh, X-rays, but really white field. But there then becomes a technological challenge too. So thank you once more, Rafaela. Let's see if there is one more last question. Otherwise, I know that Rafaela has to go to teach. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, nine o'clock now, your time in the morning, of course. Yes, in the morning, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So otherwise, uh, thank you once more, Rafaela, and um, for this beautiful talk. And um, yeah, I would, all, well, there was one last question or not one raised hand, I can still take one, but otherwise, okay, there is no raised hand anymore. So I wish also to uh, inform you that the next Understanding Science Seminar will be on the 21st of October and it will be on planetary magnetic field with Sabine Stanley from John Hopkins University. So um, please follow the Understanding Science Seminar and thank you once more, uh, dear Rafaela, for your beautiful talk. Bye. Thank you Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.